Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar Open Science and the Case Study of War Torn Ukraine. My name is Natalia Shulga, and I will moderate this event on behalf of the Global Science Pillar at the Science and Society Program of the Aspen Institute USA. Today, we come together not only as advocates for open science, but as witnesses to the extraordinary power of human determination in the face of adversity. We're here to learn about the remarkable achievements of scientists and researchers in Ukraine who against all odds have continued their pursuit of open science. Their work is a testament to the belief that even in the darkest hours of flame of knowledge can burn brightly. In times of war, when barriers threaten to divide us, open science becomes a bridge that connects minds across borders, fostering understanding and advancing shared goals for the betterment of humanity. As we delve into the dialogues in the true Aspen Institute spirit, let us remember that our collective efforts have the power to create lasting change. Let this event be a catalyst for new ideas, partnerships, and initiatives that will not only shape the scientific landscape, but also contribute to the rebuilding of the research communities affected by war. Today, we are privileged to be joined by passionate individuals from Ukraine and beyond, all sharing a common belief in the fundamental importance of open science. Let me introduce our first contributors, Yulia Bezvershenka and Paloma Marine Arezin. Yulia has two careers already as a scientist with PhD in theoretical physics and as a civil servant when she was appointed as director general of Directorate of Science and Innovation at the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine. In 2022, after escalation of the war, Yulia co-founded organization Science at Risk that works internationally to help scientists from Ukraine. Paloma is engagement manager in the Global Consortium, Open Researchers and Contributor Identifier, ORCID. Paloma collaborates with the State Scientific and Technical Library of Ukraine to introduce Ukrainian scientists to the global world of knowledge. Ladies, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much, Natalia. Thanks, Natalia, and thanks for organizers of this event. I think what we will discuss today is truly uh, important internationally, but also especially important for Ukraine now. So we will start uh, with our dialogue with Paloma, and I'm looking forward to hear a lot of interesting things from you based on your experience. I think we should start from more general question, and then we'll focus on Ukraine. So my first question will be for you is about ORCID itself. Why it matters for the open science? Why, how it helps to promote open science? Why we at all should think about what ORCID does? and how we can promote utilization for the overall good. So, thank you very much, Yulia, for, uh, for the question. So as Natalia mentioned before, ORCID stands for Open Research um, and Contributor ID. So basically the initial idea was to have a, an open persistent identifier for researchers that they can use whenever they want uh, in their career, regardless uh, their uh, nationality or regardless where exactly they are performing research or uh, the system, the institution, or even the subject area. So it can be used by someone in physics, but also by someone in the humanities or, or arts. And this is uh, the most important part for, for researchers. Also, it helps disambiguating names and uh, considering also name variations. So if we think, for example, of the Ukrainian context, then you might have names written in Latin letters, but also in Cyrillic. So uh, then, um, okay, is this article or is this data set authored by this person or this person? Or when we change from Cyrillic into um, 
Latin letters, are we adding a double I or uh, a how do we convert those letters exactly? Because sometimes there is a one one match, but sometimes there isn't. So this disambiguation was um, uh, quite important. And then also when ORCID was was funded, uh, the idea was always to have an open platform. And this is why ORCID as an organization is also a non-for-profit that is not going to be sold to any uh, larger commercial entity. And we have some funding principles based on open science principles as well. So the public data that we have is always shared under a CC0 license and the software that we use or the codes that we write is open source as well so that people can basically replicate what uh, is going on or reuse the uh, the data as metadata in the system that that they want so at the end that's that's the idea that data can flow and can be reused from one system to another and at the end researchers are benefiting from from that Thank you, Paloma. It's really very interesting. And I would say as the former civil servant, when we are making decisions about uh, science policy, we need to have the proper data which we can use. And in Ukraine, I know there are a lot of things that you are describing about uh, um, mispronunciation or different pronunciations of uh, names, but also about institutions. We have a bunch of institutions which are only covered in uh, databases, it's, for example, National Academy of Science sciences without some particular institution and it messes all the numbers and you can't really understand what is where so it is really important to see these differences and now uh, more about like Ukraine uh, before the full-scale invasion and after it uh, what uh, peculiarities of using ORCID you see there and how ORCID can become a tool of better decision making on science policy regarding the war and regarding the damages of war, but also in uh, identifying the vital centers, the prominent people in the sphere on whom we can rely on rebuilding Ukraine, on winning the war first, first and then on rebuilding Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for the question as well. I think one uh, very important thing to highlight um, is the role that the state scientific and technical library has had in this, in this process because even in the middle of the uh, conflict situation, they took the uh, leadership of the Ukrainian ORCID consortium. And uh, since then, this was uh, in October uh, 2022, they've been doing an amazing job in promoting ORCID in general among um, uh, Ukrainian institutions and also talking to both organizations and researchers about, about that. Uh, sometimes I um, I present and then I translate my slides into Ukrainian, uh, but of course I can't speak the language. So the uh, the library has been super helpful in uh, translating and accommodating all these uh, peculiarities. One thing that is important about ORCID is that um, it is not an isolated ID. The idea is that the ID is connected to other identifiers that um, identify other entities in the uh, research ecosystem. So for example, uh, a organization that is going to be um, identified by a ROAR ID, Research Organization Registry ID, can be connected to ORCID when the organization or the, uh, the researcher adds a proper affiliation um, to that person. So, uh, this was something that has been developed in a very good way uh, for, by, by uh, Ukrainian institutions. One example that we recently displayed was uh, Tara Sevchenko National University. They've done an amazing job adding uh, affiliations to their researchers. So now someone can identify not only who the person is, but also where the person performs uh, research. And they can, uh, as you were mentioning, Julia, in the case of, of uh, databases, associate researchers with uh, the institution and then have proper numbers. There is another thing that um, we currently 
don't have a lot of data in ORCID explaining or showing exactly the country where the person is. So approximately 32% of all records that we have at ORCID contain that country information. So probably there are way more researchers uh, in Ukraine than the ones that we can highlight. And also something that might be in the future very interesting is to motivate researchers or organizations to add that country. And if they uh, if they started in Ukraine, but they moved to another country as well, uh, let's say Germany or, or, or Poland, because of the, the, the conflict situation, to analyze how many researchers have two countries, Ukraine and another one. But um, in, in general, the, the um, ORCID consortium in Ukraine and particularly SSTL of Ukraine, they've done a very good job precisely with that, motivating organizations to add that affiliation so that the research that is produced in Ukraine and that connection researcher institution is clearer and, and people can identify that. Thank you, Paloma, for providing such brilliant examples of resilience of Ukrainian institutions, which are through the war are doing great job uh, in promoting uh, such important things, which are maybe not very, you know, day-to-day -day importance is clear, but it is so important they understand and then in long term it, it, they should do this. My question is the following. Do you envision any particular national-wide approaches, strategies in order to push more and more researchers to see the value of being represented? Because these examples of institutions, we can understand they are interested to be seen. But what about national uh, level? We have this in our documents, like we want to do this, but really what policies can you advise us on? To my knowledge, and if I'm not mistaken, there is already a, a, an open science policy in place in Ukraine that, that mentions ORCID. Um, in general, what uh, we can do uh, when it comes to researchers and scientists in general using ORCID, um, and this applies to Ukraine and applies also to other countries as well, is understanding or helping researchers to understand why this can help them. And in many cases, this goes also with a language management and also a right onboarding information. So uh, in ORCID right now, we are working on helping researchers when they register for an ORCID ID to understand the next steps, where they can connect the ORCID ID, where they can add an affiliation and, and so on. And then, in, in the particular case of Ukraine and what I've heard from, from the Ukrainian consortium is that many researchers are a bit scared that having an ORCID ID is going to add on, on top of their burden and it's going to be another identifier and another process that they need to have, basically. So uh, a very good approach here, uh, probably at a policy level, but also at an institutional level and from ORCID in terms of communication is uh, showing how they can use their ORCID ID. Uh, and uh, for example, at a policy level, it can be, you know, connect your ORCID ID with your national CV platform or uh, with this uh, national system so that they see the value. Thank you very much, Aloma. I agree with you absolutely, and I think we will discuss more today on this. We are waiting for Sergei. Okay. Uh, welcome. And uh, our next panelist is Sergei Jarina, who would be interviewed by Paloma. Uh, Sergei is acting director of the Ukrainian Research Center for the Development of Information Technologies and also coordinator of system called Nauka.gov.ua. It's a national electronic scientific information system 
which was created for the storage management and exchange of data on scientific activities. Lors is yours now. So Sergey, it's going to be a pleasure to interview you in this part. Uh, and I'm very much interested in knowing more about uh, Nauka and uh, how does it function and what it is. Uh, so at first I uh, want to say thanks for Paloma and for ORCID in general because using their data, using ORCID, it's more easier to collect data, to match data about our scientists, uh, searchers and uh, other things and uh, without ORCID it uh, will need a lot of human job to, to do to uh, rewrite uh, this information and uh, about our system. Our system called Ukrainian Research Information System. It's uh, uh, based on the website Nauka.gov.ua. It's a um, uh, complex of uh, information systems that uh, together make uh, our system URIs. Uh, this information system divides uh, into portal and uh, procedures. Uh, portals include websites uh, to which uh, everyone can uh, have access and uh, watch some data uh, about Ukrainian researchers, institutions uh, and other. For example, it's a platform of Science of Ukraine, portal of information, scientific and technical cooperation, a portal of registers uh, in the field of Science of Ukraine, platform Science and Business and uh, some other in future maybe. Uh, and uh, other part of this information system, it's uh, procedures. It's information system which uh, uh, can access on the authorized user. And uh, uh, these uh, systems uh, need to digitalize, digitalize uh, some uh, functions uh, and some tasks of uh, Ministry uh, of Education and uh, Ukraine. Uh, for example, and some competition, consulting, uh, including to the register and some other model. In general, uh, we uh, collect data from some uh, information systems like ORCID, uh, resources from, like ORCID, right, like ROSREF, uh, Scopus Web of Science, and we collect some of our data from these uh, procedures of mist, uh, ministry. And uh, matching that, using that, we uh, give access uh, to uh, our users from the portals. In general, it's about our users. And so you, when it comes to uh, the uh, institutional support for the creation of, of URIs, um, can you describe a bit more why this matters uh, in the Ukrainian context? Uh, yes, uh, in Ukraine, uh, in every country, it's very important to have, in every sphere, it's very important to have uh, current data uh, in which you can uh, base your uh, decision uh, when you uh, uh, divide something and uh, exactly for science, uh, exactly for Ukraine. And uh, for our ministry, it's very important to have data uh, based on which they uh, can uh, make uh, some decisions that will be uh, useful uh, for our scientists, for our institutions. Uh, for now, in Ukraine, some uh, procedures don't digitalize, digitalize uh, some registers uh, not uh, uh, in um, machine uh, reading uh, types of uh, documents. And uh, for that, we can see uh, all, uh, um, can see some interesting insights uh, on which we can uh, make uh, this decision. Uh, divide, uh, dividing our system, uh, use uh, digitalizing more procedures, uh, collecting more data, uh, we can uh, make uh, uh, more clear uh, and more uh, powerful, useful uh, decision uh, on uh, ministry level. That's actually very interesting to um, also see the, the role of a um, research information system for the decision making at a, at a national level. 
are you finding or um, when uh, you are discussing these different data inputs into URIs, are you finding some challenges or things you uh, you think that you need to process differently? Uh, main uh, challenge will be uh, was uh, it uh, uh, first step we won't just collect data uh, because we uh, based on initiatives uh, like ORCID, like ROAR and uh, Cross uh, CrossRef and others, uh, which thought that it will be enough for us uh, to make uh, uh, some general vision of uh, Ukrainian uh, scientific sphere. Uh, but uh, starting this work, uh, we see that uh, not uh, that not all data in the system, and uh, some uh, data are not correct, uh, and uh, it uh, uh, and uh, some data we don't have it in uh, any system, and uh, for for us uh, was uh, very um, hard to uh, change our. Uh, uh, tasks uh, to digital, digitalize some uh, procedures uh, because uh, in uh, digitalization uh, it, that's not uh, just uh, to make information system uh, we much understand uh, uh, some uh, procedures some uh, forms uh, that uh, our scientific uh, institution and scientists as researchers to, uh, write, send to ministry and uh, use in these procedures because uh, the same attribute of this uh, form uh, can be uh, can have different name and different uh, counting in different uh, form. So we can ju just uh, use it and uh, collect from uh, other pro uh, different procedures. We need uh, to uh, we need to uh, change some policies, change some uh, rule documents uh, to make it uh, uh, the same, to make it uh, uh, fair principle uh, 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 compliance. <laughs> uh, yes, something like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's very interesting, and also that you're considering the the compliance with with the fair principles and and so on. Um, my last question uh, for you is that uh, do you envision that uh, URIS uh, should work as a clearing house for uh, science related issues in in Ukraine? Uh, yes. Uh, uh... Short answer is yes. <laughs> uh, long answer is uh, uh, we have uh, our team uh, focus on uh, make some uh, information product uh, for ministry, for our resources and institutions uh, and uh, tr try to make it uh, easy to use uh, and uh, useful for, for uh, all stakeholders. And uh, one of uh, our... Uh, issue our task is uh, uh, to make uh, some uh, teams of experts uh, our right uh, that can uh, interact with white audience and uh, help our researchers uh, using our system and uh, uh, collect uh, more function uh, which uh, uh, need our resources and uh, institutions in the field of science. Thank you. That was actually very uh, interesting to, to hear how how things uh, work and not only understand the, the, the core part of URIS, but also how this relates to the government. And, and the ministry in different spheres. So many thanks, Sergei, for, for those insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very insightful. And now um, I would like to welcome Alexander Beresko to the next round of discussion. Alexander is the researcher and open science advocate was many, many facets to this advocating process. Uh, he's recently co-founded the Institute for Open Science and Innovation, 
uh, and serves as the first president of this institute. Alexander is ex-president and advisory board member of Eurodoc, it's European Council for Doctorate Candidates and Junior Researchers. Alexander actually coordinated the national plan for open science development in Ukraine and is now leading an international consortium open for UA working on this implementation. I am so excited to hear about all these new developments. Yours is your now. Uh, many thanks for having me. Uh, yes, Alexander. With Alexander, we uh, meet recently at the strategic session of the ministry. In uh, practically, we talk it about open science, and I think it will be interesting uh, for our auditory. Uh, so, can you describe the institutional support? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, from your uh, extensive experience, how can you describe the necessity of the introduction of the uh, National Open Science Plan during uh, the war time? Thanks for this question, Sergei. And um, to be honest, uh, National Open Science Plan is just a policy instrument, like many other policy instruments, right? So if you a little bit rephrase this question, we can say that uh, how much is it important to introduce open science in times of war, right? And uh, I do believe that open science is science done right. And at the same time, unfortunately, Ukrainian uh, scientific and research system um, has, let's say, uh, much space to improve. So introduction of open science is a nice instrument to make uh, Ukrainian research system um, more impactful and help Ukraine uh, to not only to survive these difficult times, but also, um, let's say, uh, rebuild successfully after our victory. Uh, also, I want to bring in one quick example because uh, Ukrainian major news outlet, which is called Ukrainska Pravda, which stands for Ukrainian Truth, has recently published a uh, very interesting rankings, which is called uh, Top 10 Ukrainians uh, Leadership uh, in Times of War. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there are no researchers at all in these rankings, right? And even there is no category research or science. So that's probably, um, unfortunately, a way uh, in which uh, fellow Ukrainians perceive Ukrainian research system, and we need to act and to act quickly to, um, let's say, um, make, to improve the situation, to um, make Ukrainian research system serve the society and be uh, more impactful. Also, uh, from my perspective, because my background is computer science, web development, I totally see, uh, let's say, uh, analog between, um, let's say, web 2.0, the transition of only let's say read web to read write web, which uh, made major progress in the world wide web in, uh, in global in information environment. And I see this potential in open science. When we open up uh, research outputs, when we um, let's say not only publish papers, but also data, uh, source code, materials, and other things alongside these publications, it's much easier for us to make science more collaborative to make uh, research outputs reusable and uh, make, uh, let's say, science more effective. So that's, that is why it's important to introduce it as soon as possible. Okay, I hope that by uh, developing the initiative of open science, uh, a wide audience will better understand what is science uh, and its latest achievement and who is scientists and uh, know their, uh, how they look like. And uh, for develop uh, of uh, science uh, in Ukraine and in general, in general, it's very important uh, that uh, more young specialist experts uh, will grow in uh, uh, this uh, uh, area. Uh, how do young researchers respond to open science uh, objectives? Uh, let's say, as a like former president of Eurodoc, the European Council of Doctoral Candidates and Junior Researchers, 
uh, which represents actually young researchers, let's call it like this, uh, in Europe. Uh, let me tell you that uh, young researchers generally uh, respond to open science values and practices very well. However, uh, and this is fairly logical, then um, younger researchers, researchers at earlier career stages, are generally uh, less knowledgeable, which is only logical, right? Because they develop their skills uh, in course of their career. So uh, we totally understand that early career researchers, young scientists, junior researchers, call them whatever you want, need uh, more support to uh, start practicing open science and therefore a proper system of incentives uh, and training needs to be in place. So um, we can speak uh, much about open science, but before there is a systematic approach to introduction of open science at all levels, individual, let's say department level, institutional level, national level. Uh, before that, it's very it will be very difficult to see tangible progress. Uh, and here, uh, development of skills and uh, spreading of knowledge is a key thing. Uh, but also, uh, it's totally obvious that uh, researchers, uh, so early career stages is the perfect time to start building open science. And if we do it at this stage, then we can, let's say, raise a new uh, generations of researchers who treat open science as a default uh, way to conduct science. Uh, okay, and uh, based on this, I want to ask you, uh, does the state uh, uh, make enough steps uh, to develop op open science in Ukraine? And uh, maybe you can suggest something uh, uh, to make it uh, uh, more wide. Uh, so, of course, um... I mean, uh, Ukrainian government totally acknowledges the need to introduce open science and all related things. But uh, of course, we are also, uh, there are many constraints because open science needs infrastructure. Op and you are one of the developers of this infrastructure, by the way. And uh, that's totally obvious. Open science needs resources and, uh, and therefore we um, count much on our, let's say, European, American, other partners in the world who try to help Ukraine, right? Uh, we should also mention the new initiative, uh, the new working group, which uh, is aimed to develop new rules for research assessment on institutional level among research performing organizations in Ukraine. And this uh, working group, uh, where, by the way, Yulia Bezverchenko present here and me are present, uh, we need to, we will develop these new rules, which should also acknowledge the importance of open science and uh, other uh, new uh, ways of disseminating research, such as sharing research data openly and many other things. So uh, Ukraine indeed needs a systemic reform and our new project Open for UA, which was mentioned by Natalia, is actually aimed at bringing open science to Ukraine, not on a, like some fragmented level, but on a systemic level and change uh, national legislation and change national approaches to this. Uh, there'll be also developed an institutional toolkit for research performing organizations, which will contain uh, like many useful things, many useful, let's say policy drafts and other things which can be easily adopted by uh, universities, research institutions to start uh, practice open science systemically. So uh, in general, uh, we uh, now have a good connection with the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine and with Ukrainian government. And there is, from my perspective, a political will to actually make progress happen. So uh, let's hope that it will be the case. And we really uh, count on uh, Ukrainian enthusiasts, but also uh, on uh, our colleagues from abroad who uh, do support us and hopefully will continue doing that in the future.
thank you. I wish success uh, to the working group and uh, I uh, hope the results of the, uh, this group uh, will allow our uh, uh, legislation to better meet uh, modern uh, conditions. Thank you. Many thanks, Agi. Thank you very much. It was very, very inspirational. And uh, now I would like to welcome Juan Turekian to the next round of uh, discussion. And it's my true pleasure to introduce Juan Turekian to the webinar. Because Juan works at National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine and is executive director of the National Academies Policy and Global Affairs Division. And prior to joining the academies, he served as the fifth science and technology advisor to the US State uh, Secretary of State. And in this capacity, he advised the Secretary of State and other senior State Department officials on emerging science, technology, and, and health matters affecting the foreign policies of the United States. He is currently the co-chair of the 10-member group of advisors to the United Nations Secretary General on the role of science, technology, and innovation to advance the achievements of the Sustainable Development Goals. He has affiliation with Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and the University College London. In 2023, Juan twice visited Ukraine and worked tirelessly with the US and international partners to help Ukraine. I'm excited to hear it to this discussion between two of you. So welcome, floor is yours. Uh, hi, Logan, it's a complete pleasure of mine to uh, meet you. I'm Alexander Beresko from Ukraine. Uh, I'm an associate professor at Leopold Technical National University, so I have several questions for you. Uh, first of all, let me say that Ukraine is like super grateful to the United States for all the support we are getting from your nation, and uh, that's, that's priceless because uh, the support is really great, and we do, con do, do hope that this support will continue in the future. And also, thank you very much for visiting Ukraine in times of war, because uh, this summer I was also inviting my colleagues from Eurodoc, from Europe, to visit Ukraine. And I totally understand how it is, uh, let's say, like difficult for outsider to uh, come to Ukraine, to, let's say, to risk, uh, because um, that's totally a very brave thing of you. Many thanks for that. And maybe, may I just ask you about my first question? So, um, how is the national? How are the national academies of science, engineering, and medicine organizing support uh, of Ukrainian scientists during the war times? Mm -hmm. Alexander, thank you so much. And, and and it's it's not brave to come in for a couple of days or a few days, knowing that that you know, on the other side of the border is where your home is, and you're able to to go to safety very quickly. I I find that having spent now two different visits to Ukraine over the last you know, 10 months, um, talking to a number of our colleagues that we've known now, some for a long time, that you know it's the daily perpetual um, sort of attacks that, that sort of come out of nowhere that, that create so much of the, that feeling of, of, um, of fear, of despair, but also of, of, of a desire to, to think of the world that's gonna be in the future and not not what they're living through now. So what we did was in many ways, you know, challenging in terms of the logistics, but but in terms of safety and fear, I, I don't think that that was actually, you know, even top of mind. I do think on the other hand, it did help and being on the ground and talking to people helps place and give context to, to a lot of the conversations we've had. Um, it's not easy for everyone to get and visit Ukraine and and it's hopefully there are many more people that are helping Ukraine than are visiting Ukraine, but I do encourage that those that that have the opportunity to go and and visit and particularly if they're working in different fields or different areas to have that opportunity mm -hmm. to see both the hope but also the the challenges. Um, you really do understand, you know, it's it's very different when you're working in a laboratory that has at any given moment uh, 
water or energy cut off from it versus not working in that type of environment. The academies, as you mentioned, has been you know deeply engaged in and for a long time, by the way, even before this, in recognizing that there is a community of scientists throughout the world that share something in common, and that's called science. And that's training, it's science, it's it's a connection to the community. Mm -hmm. And that one of our goals, as always, is when possible to make sure that that community, which is an international community, remains connected to one another. Mm -hmm. In the case of Ukraine, obviously, the war added a, a level of complexity to that. So really from the earliest days, and I would say, you know, even in February of 2022, we started having discussions. Actually, in December of 2021, started having some discussions about ways that we might be best, um, most helpful in this space. What we did was a number of different pieces at the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. One is we recognized, A, we're 5,000 miles away, right? So... The best thing we could do was to identify opportunities to help Ukraine in both Ukraine and in the immediate first days of the war in those countries, particularly Poland, that were right next to Ukraine, not to do things that were encouraging people to move long distances away, that really the best way to maintain a science community is to maintain a science community that remains connected to their home country but also has the safety and the opportunities that might come from being in a country that's right outside the war zone. So we have had a long history with the Polish Academy of Sciences. And in the earliest days, worked with the Polish Academy of Sciences as they were absorbing a number of people. And actually, Poland absorbed a large numbers of people from Ukraine. But there were, amongst that group, a number of scientists. And worked with the Polish Academy to say, you have a program already in place in Poland to try to situate a number of Ukrainian researchers that had come out. Let's not recreate something. Let's help support that. And so we raised some funds to help support that effort. Over time, and with people like Yulia and Natalia, we also had the opportunity to bring together experts from Ukraine with experts from Europe, experts from the United States, to talk about what is a long-term trajectory look like. And in each of those conversations, what was clear was, as important as it was to support some of the researchers that had left Ukraine, it was critically important. In fact, the sine qua non of developing a country's and maintaining a country's science infrastructure was to identify ways to also support researchers that remained in Ukraine. And I will tell you, when I visited Ukraine in March and met with a number of the young scientists, it was quite clear that programs needed to be developed to give them the encouragement that they could remain connected to the Western scientific community, but also do so as in Ukraine. So we've done a number of programs. One of them is very early on, we created, again, that building on that partnership with Poland, we created a partnership where a principal investigator might go to Poland, but they would have a team of scientists still in Ukraine. And they would be able to have that team where they'd have access to the equipment and the facilities in Poland but still be supporting research teams, including early career researchers in Poland. Mm -hmm. In more recent times, we've created a program with the U.S. National Science Foundation and science funding agencies in Ukraine and in the Baltics and in, um, in Poland to identify ways to leverage support that those countries are giving to their science communities and to find a little bit of funding to then support the Ukrainian participation. That's called Impress You. We're in the early stages of that. And we continue to look for ways to build a larger link. And this is, I think, critical for the way that we're looking in the future, using the position of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, which has, you know, we are non-governmental, but we have close relationships with our colleagues in government, to ensure that the issues of a science and research are engaged in the broader policy discussions around the rebuilding of Ukraine in the future. That mm -hmm. the recovery of Ukraine, both its economy and its national security are dependent upon a robust and sustained science and research community and innovation community. And so better articulating that, building the partnerships both in the United States and around the world so that when global leaders are coming together to think about and map out what does a future funding for Ukraine look like, they recognize the importance of science and innovation as central to that. We've benefited greatly from the fact that a number of philanthropies private foundations, and even the U.S. government, as I mentioned before, have been supporting these efforts that we do, including, you know, Simon's Foundation, 
Breakthrough Variety Foundation, it's just a large number of foundations that have come into this space. And they have the added advantage in the United States of being nimble and innovative as that next step happens with the governments mm -hmm. coming around. Okay, many thanks for this comprehensive answer. Actually, to be honest, I am impressed with how, how much has been done and hopefully will continue uh, to, uh, let's say, help Ukraine in this regard. So, uh, so my question, next question could be like this. So let's say uh, there is an idea on how um, because you rightly said that now uh, researchers who stayed in Ukraine are also in the focus and helping them is a way to help rebuild in Ukraine because uh, it rarely can be done outside, but from inside, of course, right? So if there are ideas uh, of some probably mutual beneficial programs, like some uh, projects among Ukrainian and US researchers or like on governmental level or whatever else, uh how uh who is uh, the good like um, target audience for this who are the good ears for this so yeah. who is who can be a key person uh, whom we can advocate these ideas for for instance for instance we are trying we will try to kickstart a reproducibility network in ukraine next year right so to ensure science is truly reproducible and uh, increase the quality uh Probably there are opportunities to uh, foster this, or probably there are opportunities in some topical discussions, like like some like fields of science, such as uh, like I don't know, uh, humanities, social scientists, life scientists, whatever else. What are the opportunities? Who are the ears? Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. I think first of all, there I think there are a number of ears because good ideas happen to have um, lots of people that are interested in them. And so I mentioned this idea of this joint program we're doing with our National Science Foundation in the United States. It also has the science foundations in the Baltic states and in Poland as partners of this. And what that does is it does a couple of things. One is, A, on the funding side, it, it leverages and amplifies you know, a number of different funders around national funders and then connects hopefully as we begin to continue to raise some funds, ways to keep the Ukrainian engagement in that. And I mentioned that program for a simple reason. Those programs are oftentimes at the cutting edge of science. You know, the US National Science Foundation has a reputation historically of funding really the innovative cutting edge of a field or of the creation of fields, which means you're bringing together different expertise around it. And that expertise is not just the international expertise, it's also yeah. field expertise. And so I would encourage people to look at the Impress You work that's been done. One of the things that's also really valuable about it is it is at the highest levels of international standards, right? These are these peer-reviewed projects. But then we need to look longer term and say, those are a series of of programs and projects that exist within specific agencies. What does that overlay look like? What is the facilitating piece to that? One of the challenges, obviously, in international science that we see, and not just in Ukraine, in general is, there's something called glue money, glue, like gluing things together. Mm -hmm. Projects are often easier to fund than those little bits of money that are required to keep the system primed, to keep things sticky with one another. Mm -hmm. travel money, conference money, money that's a little bit more flexible and easy to move. What we've seen is there are models and examples around, you know, and I'll, I'll just give the U.S. examples, where there have been these sort of joint funds that get established, you know, between a country and the United States or more regional or other things. And these joint funds are designed to be catalytic and innovative. They're not large, large sums of money. They're not tens of millions of dollars. They're often the types of money that can help seed an idea, get people together, put together a workshop, put together an exchange program, put together little things to get the system moving so that the more, the more established types of bilateral or science funding can then take over for the larger projects. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen these types of arrangements exist between the US and Egypt, the U.S. and India, the U.S. and Israel, um, the U.S. and Mexico, where there's, it's again, these are not big funds, they're smaller funds, but those funds are designed to allow for um, collaborative initiation. 
And so we've been looking at different models around that and how to best uh, align those with the future uh, regional collaborations that might take place. Mm -hmm. Right, Adam. Uh, many thanks for your answers. And I really hope that uh, Ukrainian, uh, our collaboration, I mean, not personal, but general, and uh, will continue and uh, will, uh, will lead to uh, let's say, uh, renewal in Ukraine and general progress overall. Many thanks. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And now Yulia is back and we have our final round of discussion about open science in Ukraine. That's great. Thank you. So do you want me to do this? This I'll do this. It's a Yulia, it's great to see you. And it's it's always well, it's always great to see you, whether it's in person in Washington or or on the video more and more. So, you know, one of the things, Yulia, that, that I know you and I have talked a lot about is this this idea of young scientists. And young scientists, you know, and, and we all have different versions of what that that age group means, but I think we all know that those young and early career scientists are this really the the critical piece of any science system. I would be interested in your thoughts on, on what types of initiatives for reform, not just for science, but science education, could really be established to help support this cohort. They're gonna be central to the rebuilding and the maintenance of a Ukrainian science and research system. Thank you, Juan. It's a great question and it's great to see you. And I want to say that it was great to see you and your colleagues in May of 2022 because it was so important to know that here in the US, in Washington, there are people who systemically think about uh, helping Ukrainian science in the war and uh, try to use everything they know and they have and all the connections to make things happen and to support uh, Ukrainian researchers Kathleen. Um, and I think we see many results now. And one of the things of which uh, I think Alexander was asking, you are know, also having this workshop series just connecting people who are interested to help, to ha who have expertise, who are asking how can we help, connecting these people and to make them think together what they can do. I think it's very important and uh, it makes uh, sense in the long term. It's about young researchers. It's a tricky question because, uh, yeah, I'm a strong believer that we need to uh, frame all the reforms and all the support uh, in the way that we want to build the ecosystem in which a researcher at any age of age, uh, career level, uh, I don't know, regional aspect or whatever, will feel that there is an opportunity to develop, uh, to build uh, their knowledge and to be a part of Ukrainian science. So it's about a systemic approach. And, uh, but of course, young researchers, they have their specific needs, um, which uh, we know are also balanced with the thing that they have much more not only challenges but opportunities to leave the country or to switch their career and just to say goodbye to science in this sense we are always saying that either we can provide some answer to these challenges or we will lose them in one way or another of course during the war it is especially important and here is a big opportunity comes together because young people that often are those who are also motivated by a bigger picture, by a mission. And of course, providing them an answer to the question how I, as a researcher, can be part of Ukraine's victory and Ukraine's recovery can be a powerful thing, along with the opportunities to do research, to have money to do it. But also, I think it is also a crucial part. That's why I, I would say the following. Yes, we need specific um, instruments which can be about support of ukrainian uh, young researchers and researchers all together uh, but also we need some programs which can help young researchers to uh, build their connections internationally to build their skill set to grow into global researchers in all the domains of ukrainian research system which is very non-uniformly now integrated into international uh, research area and uh, to provide them answer to the bigger question, how can I help? How can I envision my future? And uh, I, I think that seeing how do researchers on the next uh, career levels live and what opportunity they have, it's also a strong motivational factor. Because if you see that 
in any career level, you do not have an opportunity to be to do what you want and to be the best version of yourself, you will never be convinced about uh, any particular local support uh, for you. So my answer is yes, long term opportunities, these answers to complex questions, but also short term support for those who are uh, who are now trying to do research in the days of war. Yeah, no, I, I I completely agree. It's that you know, even as we keep our eye to the distant, we we've got to make sure that we're looking at what are we doing to invest today, because you can come and have all these great ideas that are five years away, and if no one's around, there's nobody to actually pick up the mantle and actually do it. So, and and as you mentioned, young researchers are often the ones that have the greatest ability to leave the field or to leave the country. And, and that's that's something that I think is is a key piece. So, you know, as we're thinking about the long term, though, you know, I know a lot of times you talk about the term recovery. But one of the things about recovery is we know that there's going to need to be, as in any system, the types of reforms that allow for these changes. How do you see the best way to organize these types of international engagements, international programs? in this space of looking at the re broader reforms that are going to be thought through in, in Ukraine? Yeah, it's also a good, a complex question. And even before the full scale of war, it was a, an important one. And now it becomes uh, more challenging and pressing. So I think that uh, both levels work, both uh, individual and institutional. You need to support individual researchers because they are people who will make sense for the system who, as you say, who will be people who will respond in today, tomorrow, and in long term. Mm -hmm. uh, also, these people, if you support uh, researchers who are capable, who are internationally well integrated, who understand the meaning of uh, to do impact by their research, they will be your champions of change. They will support any policy or reform you envision, because without these people, you will always be in a cycle of just reproducing the old uh, traditions. Uh, in this sense, individual uh, approach is very important. Institutionally, I think there are several things. One is, of course, it's uh, all the programs should be designed uh, evidence-based uh, and like should be informed internationally too. We do, do need uh, data. We do not need assessment of needs of Ukrainian researchers and system overall. And just to put uh, the incentives into these instruments, we will, which will support right behavior or right transformation. It is always can be done. I mean, uh, I don't know, when you support the excellent science, you support behavior of researchers who are doing this excellent science. Yes, when you um, uh, aim at co creating some collaboration networks, you support this international collaboration. So just to make evidence-based decisions and uh, to think what uh, changes do we support by doing these programs. And I think our initiative, Science at Risk, is one of the ways just to provide this evidence for international decision makers. Second is a bigger answer for the question which I mentioned today, like reform of science itself is, is a part of a bigger transformation of Ukraine. Ukraine need to transform in many senses, as you said, like meaning economy, meaning national security, and utilizing smart people on the ground, utilizing the science and providing her questions to be answered. In this sense, it is very important to embed science into the vision of Ukrainian victory and Ukrainian recovery. Then people will get some specific problems. They will get their place and many more programs can come up because we all know that money, which can we internationally even find to support researchers themselves, like just researchers, are smaller than money, which will come for solving some very practical questions, which are now in Ukraine are starting from demining and uh, ending by PTSD. There are numerous. And also, I think international researchers, international companies, and international governments, it's also very important to use this opportunity to study from Ukrainian experience. So like putting the science into this overall 
um, picture of recovery and tackling these complex challenges, it also uh, can help. And the last thing, but not the least, about institutional uh, level of support of right transformations and reform in Ukraine is capacity building. We often in our workshops and discussions with you, we, we, we talk about this. This capacity building on the all levels of national decision making on special institutions like we have yep. representatives today and also on the level of research institutions and universities just to help people to empower them to think on their level, what we can do, how we can build better. And it's again, international support can be very helpful because it's transfer of expertise. These are people who are working on different places of the world on the same questions. When they talk together, they will come up what can be done on that level. And I think building this pyramid of capacity on all the levels, which are about science and education spheres, it will help uh, Ukrainians to uh, solve many problems because uh, Ukrainians are very innovative people and uh, also this war is existential for us. We understand that we need to win, either we will not exist. In this sense, supporting this skill set, supporting this capacity building by resources, but also with expertise and international ne network can be very helpful for designing transformation and more importantly, to implement it. Okay. No, I think that's I think that's absolutely right. I think and I think you actually previewed a, a second or the a, a sort of a third question I had, which was this issue of what are the ways in which we get governments, you know, we think about it from the standpoint of in the US, how do we RTO with the US government, but but clearly a critical advocate for investing in science and innovation as part of the reform and recovery of Ukraine is going to have to be the Ukrainian government itself. And so how to get more and more of that feeling that science and innovation are not adjunct, they are central. And so are there are there things you're already seeing happening in that space where, where there's a recognition within not just the science ministries, but within the broader government that a long-term recovery and stability and security of Ukraine is actually, the sine qua non of that is a, a robust science and technology community. Of course, war brings uh, a lot of uh, new conversations around this because we see on the ground a lot of uh, military innovations and people more and more who were always focused on IT innovations, uh, soft innovations are now talking about deep tech and they understand that you need people who understand all these words, who are engineers or researchers who can do these things. So I think there is natural uh, results uh, of the war in order to make more attention to this area and to rethink the place of science innovation in overall uh, national security and economy. On the other hand, uh, we know that uh, in, during this year in um, spring, uh, uh, we have now new like we have vice the prime minister who is responsible for education, science, innovation, and digitalization. And it's important because for the first time we have like explicit vice the yep. prime minister who is explicitly responsible, like politically on the one hand. On the other hand, this is Sotoro uh, who, who has experience of uh, implementing horizontal policy. And it is very important because the, one of the challenges for Ukrainian government, and I think in, for any government is to work with the policies which are inter-institutional, um, which are uh, horizontal through the government. And I think they have some experience on doing this. They are now working on the national mm -hmm. strategy um, uh, for innovational development. And I think uh, science and innovation, like deep tech innovation, will find their place in, in this strategy. But of course, the question is much larger. We can write down strategy. We can uh, like have more conversations around this. But what are the real instruments to implement this policy and this strategical thinking? We are far from that. And I think these pilot programs, which can be done internationally, they can be convincing factor to show the result, to show that like focusing on some specific questions or locally in geographical sense, we can provide something which really can matter and show that it is like good idea to, to it can work for regional in innovational development, for economical development, for national security, so on. So I think it's a long way to go. We have some good science, we have some bad challenges which push us to do this, and we have great friends internationally, including you, uh, who help us to pilot different ideas. And think, I think overall it will uh, cause the change of attitude and the right place for science and innovation in Ukraine's victory and recovery. Thank you, Yulia. So Natalia, I'll turn it back over to you, but, but thank you, Yulia. 
for yes everyone. now yeah. we have all our participants back together and we have about 10 minutes for the questions we receive from our audience um and if somebody wants to comment please raise the hand so i can see uh and uh, the first question is to all participants and I would ask you to answer short in, in a short manner. Uh, the question is, is the principle of open science viable in time of war? Let's start with, I don't know, Sergei maybe? Okay, yes. Uh, in science, we have uh, military and civilian uh, technologies, uh, civilian uh, research uh, researchers uh, that focused on uh, some uh, part of that. Uh, for now, we can't uh, make uh, military uh, technology, uh, military results of our researchers uh, open. Uh, but in based of uh, civilian uh, technologies, it's uh, Yes, we can make it open science and open access for that. Anybody else wants to comment about viability of open science principles during the war? Okay, Let Alexander. If I may quickly, so uh, the principle of open science has always been as open as possible, as close as necessary. So as Sergei said, of course, some things need to be closed and some things can be open. But uh, open science is actually empowering um, disadvantaged researchers who, for instance, have fled from like uh, temporarily seized territories, for instance, right? Because in Ukraine, we have a big number of this so-called displaced universities who moved to mainland Ukraine, which is under control of Ukrainian government. And these researchers often don't have any access to, let's say, paywalled uh, research databases such as, okay, let's say lots of them. So open science is actually empowering them to get access to knowledge and continue their work. Thanks. Okay, Paloma. Yeah, so um, also adding on that, um, basically, um, open science has different branches and different parts. So open science is kind of an umbrella term. So there might be things, as, as Alexander was mentioning, that might need to be as close as necessary. And also Sergey mentioned during his intervention before uh, about the fair principles. So basically what we need to uh, pay attention to probably when we need to keep some data uh, closed uh, or when we need to keep some software closed or when we need to keep some technology closed is that the fair principles are still there and, and we can basically correctly identify the source even if that's a private source or correctly identify the authors even if we need to keep them um, uh, closed, so to say. So there is no incompatibility between a war situation and applying principles related to open science. Excellent. Julia? I completely agree with my colleagues. I would just add, uh, in times of war, we need uh, quick uh, decisions. Uh, and to, to do this informed decision making so quickly, you need reliable data on different dimensions. We need this definitely. Second, uh, due to Ministry of Education and Science, up to 35% of Ukrainian research infrastructure is damaged. So uh, Alexander said about uh, internally displaced people, but some people just can't use the infrastructure anymore. So they rely on other data data uh, which can be accessed through open science channels. Third is optimal usage of money. We are now living all our budget uh, is uh, only because we have a lot of international partners and friends. So we need to optimally use uh, budgets and it means uh, joint usage of infrastructure, joint usage several times usage of different data and so on. And the same about integration into European research area and into international research area, like using sharing their information, their data on science, we can help our scientists to be 
you know, on board and to be active even through the times when they can't use uh, Ukrainian infrastructure. And the last thing which is connected with this is about, uh, Sandra mentioned this, about collaboration building. It is the moment when Ukrainian researchers not only have an opportunity to build this collaboration, it is the moment which pushes them, even those who earlier didn't have any collaboration at all. And open science provides some real and very focused way uh, for these researchers to be part of international teams and to work internationally. Thanks. We have a question which probably addressed to uh, Ukrainian uh, participants. Outside of the government sponsored science and research, have you thoroughly explored major philanthropic investments sponsored by individuals or principal investigatorship? for your open source initiatives? Have you experienced resistance or success? Okay, Alexander. So, okay, so let me tell you that uh, I am leading several uh, projects which aim to bring open science in Ukraine and all of them are funded externally. So uh, we are lucky to have uh, like generous funding dedicated for Ukraine from the European Union, which is our neighbor and hopefully will be a part of European Union at some point, right? But also I am aware of uh, many um, funds, uh, foundations who might be interested in funding like initiatives and researchers in Ukraine. And that's indeed a good question. So we are very keen to expand our, let's say, network of possible uh, funders and we should definitely look in this direction, many things. Just uh, to on what Alexandra said, we had uh, before the full scale war, we tried to find uh, partners in business to build uh, Nauka Gov UA. Uh, it wasn't successful, even though we have a bigger uh, IT potential there, because it wasn't clear why it sh should be funded, why it's important at all. But I think uh, as such projects as Alexander is leading are being implemented as uh, Nauka Govier becomes a real platform which can be seen by business also, it will be easier to build this dialogue and also find money because people will see the added value. Okay. Another okay. one more comment in this small direction. comment just, yeah, yeah, just, just just to respond to Yulia because she mentioned very nice and important thing. Open science helps to build trust in science and in a research system. So wh when we have trust, it will be much more easier to attract funding because mm -hmm. business is not not against helping people. They just need to understand. So that's where open science can help. Thanks. Okay. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left, but uh, from our audience, there is a question again for everybody. Uh, can we know the kind of science and technology employed in the war? I think it's very provocative question and maybe uh, someone can give the correct answer to that. I would say uh, that we have a lot of uh examples of it starting from Ukrainian studies, which we now understand were underestimated inside Ukraine for many years, but also were suppressed by Russian studies all over the world. And now researchers begin to be more vocal and it is fight for misinformation, for wrong imperialistic uh, narratives of Russia and so on. So it's one uh, part of spectrum. And on another part of spectrum, we know all these uh, demining initiatives, uh, which heavily rely on scientific expertise and remote sensing on analysis. Uh, and uh, I think that I would say now it will be hard to find the science which will won't be engaged in some sort of solving war related issues. And the main thing is just to build the right teams of people who have some different experiences, also international inside uh -huh. Ukraine. To, to make them working on these complex challenges. And I would promote here National Academies of Sciences forthcoming event on ecocide in Ukraine. It is an example when people from different spheres, engineers and researchers are talking about different aspects from national uh, natural habitat to, I don't know, water pollution, from the mining to like different aspects of this, because then you see that it can't be solved by one institution, even by one country. It is truly global science uh, approach are needed in open science. 
Okay, at this moment, I would like to thank all our participants, especially those from Ukraine. We had an insightful conversation and for that we are very grateful. We thank all our global listeners for the questions and interest in this topic. Please follow our publications and future events at our link to the Aspen Institute Science and Society program. And see you very soon and have a peaceful, enjoyable holiday season. Slava Ukraini. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone.